Man, this looks good. <laughs> Even though we're spread out in every other pew. That's great. Good to see everyone here this morning. We're grateful that you're out. We're grateful that you're healthy. Everything's doing well. We still do not know of anyone in this congregation that's got the, the virus. That's great. Number 663 will be our opening song. 663. There's still some seats right up here at the front. Okay? You guys scoot in a little bit. Gloria, you and Kevin scoot in a little bit. Jonathan, Caroline come in every side. Six hundred sixty-three. After this, with Larry and Nave, we'll direct our minds in our open prayer. Join with me, please. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sun. Shine while the peaceful at the moment roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today, a carol to my King. And Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, the sunshine, blessed sun, shine while the peaceful happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you today to honor you and to glorify you and thank you as we pray through your Son, Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for letting us gather here today to worship and humble ourselves before you and thank you for this opportunity to study your word and have fellowship with our brothers and sisters and friends. Father, we pray that all we say and do today is all about you and your word, and may we continue to worship you in the spirit and the truth. Father, we pray that you would give us the faith to stand strong against Satan as he takes the things of the beauty of this world and deceives us through the envies and lies and self-pleasures of this world. We pray, Father, that we would never pay evil for evil. Father, we may we, we need to feed our souls daily and be obedient servants because we know one day you'll require our souls. We know, Father, that each of these days you have blessed us with it comes from the love you have for us. And we thank you for Jesus and everything he means to us. And may we always live in a way that we would be worthy to him. Father, we pray for our leaders, our teachers, and all the brothers and sisters who makes North Hamilton an accessible place to worship. <clears throat> Father, we, we pray that you would continue to bless Brother David and you would continue to bless him with the knowledge and the courage and the strength necessary to guide us in a way that we might 
become better and stronger Christians each day. Father, we pray for their everyone that this pandemic has disrupted their lives and for the ones who have lost loved ones to this terrible disease. Father, we pray for the ones missing today, those who are undergoing medical procedures, ones homebound, ones convalescing away from home. We pray, Father, for your comfort of your love and affection in your mercy for them that they may have their health restored and they could be back with us soon. We thank you for your presence as we open our hearts and our minds as Brother David brings another portion of your word. Bless him, Father, as he instructs us in such a way that we can understand your word and apply it to our lives and be better Christians. Father, may we be an influence on others who are not familiar with you or familiar with your word of the Spirit. Father, thank you for blessing us with your kingdom, your grace, your love, and everything that we need to sustain life. Father, we pray that all things on earth would be like things in heaven. Father, forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. We love you, Father. We love Jesus. And it's through him we pray this prayer. Amen. Before Keith stands before us and mentions some of the things that Christ sacrificed on our behalf, let's sing number 736. 736. The first two stanzas, please. <coughs> Seven hundred thirty-six. Jesus the Lord laid his glory aside, sinners to save and make whole. Freely he died our transgressions to hide. What is he worth to your Oh! 
I want us to think of the word sacrifice this morning, as Art just mentioned. And I want us to dwell on that for just the next few minutes, the word sacrifice. In your mind, I want you to think about that word and what it actually means to you as you prepare the Lord's up to take the Lord's up this morning. If you think about the last several months, we've all had to sacrifice a little bit. You know, maybe stay at home when we wanted to go out or, you know, forget things that we would normally do just to stay home to stay safe. Wear a mask, <clears throat> wear a mask in here this morning is not pleasant for a lot of people. You have to sacrifice. But think about the ultimate sacrifice as we take the Lord's Supper. When Christ died upon the cross for you and I, the ultimate sacrifice. And we're going to dwell on that as we take the Lord's Supper this morning. Let's read a few words, and as we think about that sacrifice, let's think about the sacrifice of Christ's body on the cross, the sacrifice of Christ shedding his blood. So we can partake of this Lord's Supper with him this morning. We're going to be reading from Luke 22. We're going to start at verse 14. And as we read these words, dwell in the word sacrifice. When the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup, and he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say it to you, I will not drink of the fruit of vine until the kingdom of God has come. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, the sacrifice which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to the man to whom he is betrayed. Let's go to God in prayer as we remember the sacrifice. Our Lord, our God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to you in prayer and give you thanks for this bread as we partake it and remembrance of Christ's broken body upon the cruel cross. As we as Christians here today, we partake of this bread, let us remember the body and we may take it in a manner that's well-pleasing in our sight. These things we ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. continue as we offer things for the fruit of the vine. Likewise, Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless us as we partake of this fruit of the vine as we remember Christ's shed blood upon the cross. May we as Christians take this fruit of the vine in a manner that's well pleasing in our sight. These things we ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. Him encouragement this morning would be number 588. If you want to mark that, of course it'd be on the board. Sinners, Jesus will receive number 500.
88. A couple of songs before the lesson this morning. Number 53 will be the first one, please. Number 53. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy, there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul for liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Mercy, thou with great and grace was free, pardon thou would multiply to me, there my burdened soul for liberty at Calvary. Lesson number 667. 667. Six, Would you like to stand before we sing the song? Please, as we're singing. Number 667. Would you be free from the burden of sin? That's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lord. There is power. In the precious blood of the Lamb Would you be free from your passion and pride There's power in the blood Power in the blood Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide There's wonderful power in the blood There is power, power Wonder working power the blood of the Lord. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Thank you. Please be seated. Open your Bible with me this morning to Galatians, the third chapter. Galatians chapter 3. If you're sitting in the back, you may have an idea, but I can promise you the view from here is a lot different than there. I agree with Art. It looks great seeing the full crowd here today. I'm a toucher. I have to stay away or I'll be all over you. Um, I've, I had to kind of just camp right up here because uh, I can't not touch. You know, if there's a, I'm the guy in the, in, the, in the movie, they say there's a big shiny red button. Don't touch it. I'm the guy that does this, you know, in the button. I can't not touch, but um, boy, it's good to see this crowd. It is really good. Very emotional to see that. I should have brought my camera. I would love to have a picture 
of this. Maybe we can do that. Um, it's good. It, 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 you know, I, people talk about the new normal. Um, whether you're all on board with that or not, um, this feels more like normal, and I'm glad for that. I'm glad for that. If you're a student of the book of Acts, you may remember that in the book of Acts there is a historical reference to an edict issued by Caesar Claudius. It's in Acts chapter 18. It's in the first two verses. And you may remember that when Luke is writing the book, he says that Claudius commanded the Jews to leave Rome. He expelled the Jews from the city of Rome. Now later in that chapter, we learn that it was because of the expulsion of the Jews that Paul was able to come in contact with Aquila and Priscilla and they became lifelong friends, lifelong co-workers in the gospel. But let's go back historically and remember that when that edict was issued, it was issued in the year A.D. 49. Now that's a matter of historical fact. That's not made up. There's no conjecture about the time. It was issued in A.D. 49, and that edict stood in place, in force, for five years until the death of Claudius in A.D. 54 in the city of Rome. They were expelled from the city of Rome. All Jews were cast out of the city of Rome because of that. Now, if we think about that, that would tell us that there must have been a sizable Jewish population in the city of Rome. I don't know what the actual number is. There probably is somewhere in some historical record an estimate as to the number of Jews that were expelled out of the city of Rome. But it must have been sizable. And it also tells us, especially based on some things we read last week in Acts chapter 2, that there must have been a heavy Jewish influence in the church in Rome prior to the edict in A.D. 49. But think about that. With the Jewish Christians gone for nearly five years in, in Rome, things would change a lot dynamically in five years. The church was still working. It was still growing. Paul writes about the tremendous efforts of the church in Rome. And yet the culture, the people, the opinions probably changed dramatically in the course of five years, moving from a predominantly Jewish congregation to a predominantly Gentile congregation. Imagine as a Jew five years later, you go back into the city of Rome where you live, but you had been expelled from. You go back in to resume your normal life, but you're a Christian and you go back to services the next Sunday and instead of it being a predominantly Jewish congregation, it is now a predominantly Gentile congregation. The churches had changed substantially, not in doctrine, not in truth, but in culture, in matters of opinion, in dynamics it had changed. And when Paul writes the book of Romans, it is clear that there was friction, as there were in a lot of parts of the world back then, between the Jews and the Gentiles. Question, how did Paul resolve that issue? between two socially diverse groups of people. How did he do that? How did he address the issue of what today we would call a black or white or a rich or poor issue? How did he do it back then? How did he, how did he resolve the issue and challenge the issue of social division? How did he do that? In one verse we learn. Romans 1.16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel. It's our, the gospel It's the power of God to salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. To all who believe. He used the gospel to answer the issue of social division in his day. I am extremely concerned, and maybe you are too, with the way that our world is trying to approach the issue of social division today. Ironically, what some people are doing to try to fight what they are calling racism is to enact racism. But I'm even more concerned with the way that some Christians are approaching the subject. Because to hear some people talk, it's as if the Bible doesn't have answers to it. Do we believe that the Bible is actually capable of bringing two different groups of people together? Are they really that different at all? 
Or are we buying into the argument that's being sold by our world that somehow the issue of racism evades the cross? That somehow that the Bible may answer a lot of issues, but, but racism is not one of those. That somehow the issue of black or white or even socially rich or poor, those are issues that cannot be addressed in Scripture. And with all of our heart, I know with all of mine, we say that the gospel is the only answer to the issue of racism. Last week we started, it was just basically one gigantic sermon, but we couldn't get it all in one week. And so we looked at this issue in Galatians 3, verses 26 through 28, where he ends in verse 28 by saying, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And we looked at that concept of one in Christ, and we sort of are working our way through the book of Galatians, and we learned at the beginning last week that the church has always struggled with issues of social division. We looked at examples in the, in the book of Acts that from the very outset of the church's existence, while the church is perfect in the way that it was designed, in the way that God patterned the church, that there were always issues in the church where you had different groups of people and they struggled with those different groups of people. Even the apostle Peter struggled with it. Remember last week in chapter 2 of the book of Galatians in verse 11, Paul said, when I came to Antioch, I had to challenge Peter to his face because even the apostle Peter had withdrawn from certain members of the church because of their ethnicity, because of their cultural background. And Paul said it wasn't right, and I challenged him on it. They've always struggled with it. We have always struggled with it as the church. But we found that the Bible is the only answer. Man-made solutions do not work. They never work. In fact, beginning in chapter 1, where Paul is addressing this issue all the way through the book, he begins by saying, I don't preach my gospel, I preach the Lord's. These words aren't mine, they're God's. I'm not trying to impress people, I'm trying to impress my Father in heaven. To emphasize that there's a, a chasm wide between the answers that people give and the answers that God gives. So let's continue. This will be our first point. It's kind of our third in the series, but it's our first point today, and that is this. In Galatians 3, there is a glorious implication in, in the idea of conversion, and it's being missed in our world today because our world is telling us that there really is no spiritual answer to it. This is just a, a political, a systemically political issue, and it has to be solved that way. And we disagree because in the very concept of conversion, something is affirmed in the very concept of conversion. Go with me to chapter 3. And I want to go back to verse 10. Instead of getting to verse 26 right away, let's start in verse 10. Paul, is, he's been dealing with this now for uh, at least two chapters. He's still dealing with it in chapter 3. This division between the Jew and the Gentile. And he says in verse 10, For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now watch carefully. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now notice how when Paul is arguing about bringing us to the cross, he goes back to the very promise at the beginning to Abraham. Remember that promise? In chronological and textual order, it's in Genesis chapter 12. Remember that? And he says to Abraham a number of things, including that through him all the nations of the earth, do you remember, would be blessed. That's, that's talking about salvation. That's what Paul was doing right here. He said that promise to Abraham wasn't some sort of a physical blessing. It was you know, The physical blessing was that his descend, descendants would be as the stars of the sky, you know, as, as the sand which is by the seashore. He said it, it would be that expansive physically, but spiritually all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. What that is is a continuation of the promise of Genesis 3.15 that the seed of woman would crush the head of Satan. And that promise came through Abraham. Remember, remember how Genesis is developed? Do you remember in chapter 11 what event just transpired? 
Tower of Babel. The division of men. They're split in different languages in the world. Divides up. And just prior to that was the universal flood of Noah. And you remember what happened in the flood of Noah in the aftermath? The world of men rebooted through that family. And the same the same pledge and the same promise to Noah and his family was the one originally made to Adam and Eve that they were to replenish the earth, fill the earth. That's what they were to do. When God makes the promise to Abraham in chapter 12, he's just had a division of men in chapter 11, but the rebooting of the world of men in chapter 9 of Genesis, when God said all the families of the earth would be blessed, God means, based on everything contextually, it, it includes everybody. There's not a single exception to the all families that would be blessed. God had in mind black and white, red and yellow, rich and poor, male and female, everybody. That's who he had in mind as a recipient of those blessings. So it makes sense when we get to about verse 19 that he would now be saying there's only one way that can ever happen. Notice in verse 19, what purpose then does the law serve? That would be the law of Moses. It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. He's showing us that in mediation you have two parties, You've got the mediator who stands between. God is one side. Man is the other. You've got to have somebody in the middle. That's Jesus. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confirmed to all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Notice. But before faith came, take note. In this passage, when the word faith is used, it appears in the original language with definite article. Now that's fancy, but it's just a way of saying, but before the faith came. And in the New Testament, when you have a reference to the faith, it's a reference to the gospel. But before the faith came, we were kept under and guarded by the law, but kept before the faith which would afterward be revealed. So now we have a contrast between the inadequacy of the law, which was never intended to be the answer to the remedial system, and now the faith, which is the answer to the remedial system. Therefore, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified literally by the faith, by the gospel, the system of the gospel. But after, literally, the faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. What he's saying is God's answer to all of that division that may have existed in the world and certainly in the first century is the faith, the gospel. So in verse 26, for you are, notice the language, you are all. Well, that would be Jew and Gentile. You are all the sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, literally the faith. For as many of you, those from Jew and Gentile, who have been baptized into Christ, have been on Christ. The result of that is, in verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all Jew and Gentile, one in Christ Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Here's what happens. The, the gospel is preached. Right? So we hear it. And the Bible teaches that we have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And then we repent of our sins. We make a confession with our mouth that Jesus is who he claimed to be, Romans 10.10. 10. And we go down in water and we come up out of the water. We're Christians. And according to verse 27, when we do that, we put on Christ. Paul says the consequence, the practical consequence of that is that there's no more Jew or Greek, there's no more slave or free, there is no more male or female. And that is the glorious implication that in order for that to be true, it means that there has to be something common about people. See, when God made that promise to Abraham, and that's what Paul made earlier reference to, he was talking about everybody, all the families of the earth that had literally just been rebooted in the family of Noah and that had been begun at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. A lot of people make a, a big deal about, the, about division in our world based upon skin color. But we all come from Adam and Eve, and we all ultimately came again from Noah and his family. At the Tower of Bible, there was just one race of men, and then God scattered them because of their, 
they were unified, but in, in error they had done that. And then he makes a promise in the very next chapter that he intends to save as much as would be respectable of his will, everybody that's involved in that. There is only one race of men. It is the human race. We have common ancestry. We have common composition. That in order for this to be true, that as many as would be baptized into Christ have put on Christ, meaning that when you peel back the layer of skin and you get down to the very core of a man, minus the white or black or red or yellow, what's on the outside, inside all of us is a soul and a spirit. And ultimately we all come from Adam and Eve and Noah and his family. It means we all have common need. No matter what your social status is, whether you are rich or poor, whether you come from the Jewish or the Gentile background, so to speak, we all have the common need of salvation. And the answer for all of us is exactly the same. There's not an answer for Jews, so to speak, or an answer for Gentiles. It is the same answer for both. It implies that everybody is ultimately the same. So that in verse 26, we can all be the sons of God. And in verse 29, we can all, every one of us, black, white, red, yellow, be the heirs of Abraham's seed. The, the recipient of those promises given to Abraham. Now in the book, in Galatians, he, he starts to show us what the practical implications of that would be. See, it's not just physical commonality that we have common ancestry physically, but now in Christ we have common spiritual goals. Very practical consequences. Like in chapter 6, when he says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in verse 1, and any trespass you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. That's not with consideration of the skin color, but what's on the inside. Or how about verse 2? Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let each one examine his own work, verse 4, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. And then verse 5, each one bears his own load. And so you have this concept now in Christianity that there's a care for each other. Like in, the, as it was in Romans 12, 15, that we weep with those who weep and we rejoice with those who rejoice. In Jesus Christ now, despite whatever physical differences there may be, now we care for each other, listen to each other. We have humility when it comes to the concerns of others. But the very idea of conversion means that we're not all that different. Not at all. Here's the last thing we're going to say in this, I guess, a limited series. It's our number two point today. And that is that in Christ, we become blind to the things that divide people in the world. For example, in verse 28, neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, neither male or female. When you obeyed the gospel, let's say you're a, you're a woman, you obeyed the gospel. Did you stop becoming a woman when you came up out of the watery grave of baptism? Were you no longer a woman? Were you still a woman? What about when you were a man? Are you still a man? What about if you had a ton of money and you obeyed the gospel? Do you still have a ton of money? What about if you had no money and you obeyed the gospel? Do you still have no money when you come up out of the watery grave? What, what about if you had Jewish background, Jewish culture? That's where you came from. And you were raised out of the watery grave of baptism. Did you still have Jewish background? You still have Jewish culture? If you're a Greek, you still have Greek culture? What if, you're a, what if you're a black man or a black woman and you obey the gospel? Do you stop being black because you came out of the watery grave of baptism? Do you stop being a white person because you came out of the watery grave of baptism? What it means is when we are raised to walk in newness of life, when we are now one in Christ, the things that divide people, the petty things that people place as markers of division in our world, those things are gone. We don't acknowledge those things anymore, but conversion doesn't change what we are physically. It doesn't remove that. You're still black or white. You're still rich or poor. Just that's not our identity anymore. We're the sons of, of God now. We are the children of Abraham. That's who we are. But you still have whatever skin color you have, and you still want to have whatever the money is in your bank. It's still there. It's just that in Christ, while we give up our sins, we do not give up our experiences. I, I don't know. I'm not black. But I would say as a, as a black person, 
in America or anywhere else in the world, your experience as a black person is likely very different than the experience of a white person, just like the experience of a white person is very different than the experience of a black person. And God is not saying all of a sudden now in Christ we discount every experience in the world. You don't have to do that. What we do say is those things no longer divide us because in Christ we're one. I don't have to give up my culture and you don't have to give up your culture when we become a Christian. You're not required to do that. I'm only required to depart from culture when it causes me to stand against Jesus Christ. Here, I guess here's why I'm saying that. There are a lot of people, and I've, I've said it before, and I know what we mean when we say this, right? We're saying, um, we say, uh, in Christ, uh, we become colorblind. Well, that's, yes, okay, in the sense that we don't, uh, that's, whatever you're, whether you're, you know, you're Asian or Hispanic or black or white or, you know, Caucasian, it's a, whatever, you know. We, we're all one in Christ, all right. But at the same time, we acknowledge that some people are different than us in the sense that um, their culture, their skin color, their identity is different than us and their experiences are different in Christ. Um, does the Bible teach that we are fearfully and wonderfully made? Should you be ashamed to be a black person? No. Is that not the way that God fearfully and wonderfully made you? Should you be ashamed to be white? No, isn't that the way that God fearfully and wonderfully made you? And, does, and don't we in Christ get to celebrate the fact that as whatever you are, we are unique. That's the way God made me. I am blessed in being what I am. And you are blessed in being what you are. And if the world understood that, that our Maker made us, that we all come from Adam, we have common ancestry, maybe we could say, it doesn't matter what you are, I'm glad that you are what you are because you have this unique experience given to you by God Himself and we can all celebrate that. I guess here's what we're saying. There are a lot of people in this world who are saying that racism cannot really be abolished until every single person in the world has had the same experience as everybody else. That is hogwash. It's simply not true. It is anti-gospel to say that. Paul is advocating for, in chapter 3, verse 28, that everybody has unique experiences. Jews had a unique experience that Gentiles would never experience. Gentiles had a unique experience that Jews would never experience. And not once did Paul say, get rid of your culture, get rid of your experiences. He never said that. But he did say that when you come in Christ, you're able to move past whatever differences there are, and you put division behind you. In Christ, we are one. In spite of our differences, in spite of whatever physically or culturally they may be, and because we have been forgiven, we are then equally able to forgive and move past whatever petty issues the world tells us need to divide us. That's why I'm convinced that the Bible has the answer to what the world now says is the most pressing crisis of our times. I don't deny that there is some racism in the world. Right? And whatever, whatever rhetoric and uh, liturgy there may be and whatever, whatever people want to debate, we can talk through those things as long as we say, well, where, whatever, we come, whatever, whatever the answer is, it's right here. Right? So it's going to come here. Because in Christ, regardless of whether you're Jew or Gentile, you can now come together and you can be one in Christ. And you're still a Jew and you're still a Gentile. That's not going to change. Your culture doesn't have to change. Your experiences are going to be your own. Everybody has a different experience. And, and the experiences shape our worldview. right? They, they shape the way that we value information. And they shape the way that we hear and process things. And then in Christ we work through that. You don't have to stop being this or stop being that. or We don't have to be jealous of that person or jealous of that person. What we do is in Christ we move forward as one. That's the answer. I wish the world understood that, but it's there. We said it last week. In every single generation, every single period of time in the world where there was a crisis, the answer has always been Christianity. Always. Read history. Look at who shaped the world through history. Christianity did. Always. And if it's going to be changed now, it can never, as we said last week, you can't do it through policy. It's not, it's not gonna, that's not going to change the hearts of people. You want to change the hearts of men, you've got to do it with this. It's the only way to do it. This morning, if you're not a child of God, let's do that. Let's start there. Let's be a Christian.
Right? Because that's how we get to be one in Christ. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. When you do that, you go down in the water, you become a child of God, verse 26. You put on Christ, verse 27. And then in verse 28, we become one with all who have done the same thing. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, whether you're a Jew, Gentile, whether you're black or white, whether you are bond or free, you, you come up out of the grave and we're now equal with everybody. We stand on equal footing before our Lord Jesus Christ. Sinners saved by the grace of God. That's what we are. And it doesn't matter whether you come from whatever background you come from. Now, it may be that we become so affected by the world around us that our heart fills with things and we act certain ways that we shouldn't, contrary to what the Bible tells us, and then we have to change from that. So for a Christian, we can come back through repentance, confession, and prayer. I, I do not know how. I don't understand. Okay? I don't understand how a person could look at another human being and despise another human being because their skin color is different than their own. I do not understand that. That's, it, it evades me. I, I'm, I, I'll listen and hear and try to understand where a person's point of view is, but I don't get it. Right? I think you're the same way. But apparently in our world, some people do think that. How tragic it is. When we all come from Adam and Eve, we all come from Noah and his family, and we all have the same spiritual footing when it comes to being in sin and the same need. We're all one in a physical sense and one spiritually if we obey Christ. That has to be the answer. You know what I want one day? I know what the Bible says. God is realistic, right? That there's a wide and a broad path that leads to destruction and there's a lot of people that go in that. And there's a narrow path that leads to life and there are few who find it. I mean, that's not, that's not with regard to any kind of skin color or anything like that. But I would to God that everybody would end up on that narrow path going to heaven. That's what everybody wants. You know, Paul even said that in Romans 9. He goes, I would, if, if, it came to, if I could give myself... If I myself could, could somehow lose my own soul to gain that my brethren would go to heaven. He's talking about his Jews. I would do that. I, I don't want to give up my soul for anybody. I don't want to do that. His love was, I, I'm not there yet. I'm trying. But I don't want anybody to be lost. I don't want anybody to be lost. Even people that we perceive in this world as our enemies for whatever reason that we count them as our enemies. I don't want them to be lost. Okay. We've got to work to try to get people there. Okay? And we can't do that if they're harboring any kind of hate in our heart toward them or they're there toward us. And so the, Jesus is the answer. Always has been. What about this morning? Would you respond to the gospel invitation? Would we do it? Black, white, red, yellow. It doesn't matter. The gospel's for all, right? Let's do it as we stand and as we sing. Sinner Jesus will receive soundless word of grace to all. Sing it all and all again. Christ receive the sinful men. Make the message clear and plain. Christ receive the sinful men. Come and He will give you rest. Trust Him for. His word is plain. He will take the sinful list. Christ receive of sinful men. Sing it all and all again. Christ receive the sinful men. Make the man sit clear and plain. Receive a sinful man, even me with all my sin. Purge from every spot and stain, and with him I enter in. Sing it all and all again. Christ receive a sinful man.
seated, please. All of us who lead the singing really enjoy good singing. Well, this morning has been great. A lot of times when I'm listening to David's lesson, there's a song that jumps out at me. That just, I've just got to, got to sing it. Brad doesn't know this, so it's not going to be on board. You know it. You don't need to look it up. We're going to sing the first stanza of Blessed Be the Tie before our announcements and our closing prayer, okay? Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The good looking out there and seeing the crowd this morning. Uh, we do realize that you may not be in your scriptural pew. Uh, you may be sitting by such, beside someone you really don't know. It's a good time to meet them, okay? So, uh, but we do appreciate, you know, the main person we want to please is God in heaven, and hopefully God is pleased that we have come back together, and it certainly looks good out here seeing our brothers and sisters. You know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, as old say. I see people here I hadn't seen in a while, and boy, it sure is good to see them. And uh, we're glad. However, just because I haven't seen you does not mean I'm gonna hug you, okay? Uh, because most of you would not want that. So we, uh, we do request that we maintain the social distance, give the, give, give, give the virtual handshake, which can be done from six feet apart. Uh, and anyway, let, let's be safe and, and uh, uh, make everyone comfortable that was here this morning so that we will be back. Uh, one announcement, Dot Bryant, we, we mentioned before, this is Sue Swafford's sister-in-law and JB's aunt. Uh, as the screen said this morning, they did diagnose that she did have malignant tumors on her brain. There will be no treatment for this. She is now in a nursing home in Dunlap under hospice care. So let's remember Dot, the Swalfords, and all this in our prayers at this time. Also, uh, remember Wednesday evening, 6 o'clock on YouTube, David will be having his Wednesday evening service. So if you'll bow your head now, we'll be dismissed. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We are so thankful that we've been able to gather here and worship uh, you today. We pray that you will continue to bless us, that we may remain virus-free, that, that we may continue to come out and worship you realizing that the entire purpose of us being here this morning is to recognize you as our God and our Father and the giving of all blessings and to sing these songs of praise unto your name and to worship you as our Most High God. We pray that we'll continue with this attitude. Pray that you will be with those, dear Lord, who are unable to be with us this morning, certainly as with understanding as those who are of risk and, and those who have a feeling of, of discomfort that we certainly understand God and, and we trust in you and I know that you do too. We pray that this, this may soon pass and we will all gather here together once again. Go with us now in all things. Forgive us for our sins. Bless us. Be with us, Dot Bryant and, and the Swalford family as he, uh, during, this, their, during this time of uh, sadness and grief as, as they anticipate the passing of, uh, of Dot Bryant. We pray that you will just bless them as only you can. Go with us now. Bless us, walk with us daily. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.